Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Marketer's Corner. Today, I've invited Stephanie Burke, VP of Marketing from Sonic Commerce, to respond to MS Dynamics World's annual solution research study. For those of you not familiar, this is a study focused on finding out how Dynamics users who frequently visit MSDW are consuming online content or information sources, and then comparing their responses to how ISV marketers think they are. So welcome, Stephanie, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mary Lou. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. So to start out, Stephanie, would you tell everyone a little bit about your marketing role at SANA, please? Sure. Uh, so SANA is a global organization. We have a pretty large marketing team, around 20 individuals across the globe. My role specifically is to oversee our marketing strategy and uh, execution in North America. And for North America, uh, for us, that means the United States and Canada. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as I mentioned, Stephanie, we're going to be visiting some of the key findings that came out of our study. And I'm really interested to hear your re reaction to a couple of those. So one of our key findings had to do with several anecdotal comments made uh, by the users. And it seems they don't think that there is enough product information available to them on ISV websites that satisfies their specific question on product solution sets. So could you please explain how you handle uh, supplying product information on your site or anywhere else for that matter? Sure. I think in general, when we look at the content on our websites, it's important to find a balance between uh, sharing enough product information and also reporting on industry trends. Um, with that said, it's our product web pages that are uh, the top performing pages on our site regarding traffic and conversion. Um, and we also put time in earlier this year to optimize these pages um, once we acknowledge that. Um, we also have a focus in not only the Microsoft ecosystem, but also SAP. So when it comes to pro product content, we try to look at how each of those different vendors um, approach content for their audiences and try to mimic that on our website. We also took in, mm -hmm. We've also taken into account that our most relevant persona is the IT professional. So when handling product content, we're trying to include product screenshots, videos, or short looping clips and really clear examples uh, that, that illustrate our product on the web page. Okay, that's a great comment because uh, one of the specific comments that was made uh, several times was that the uh, users asked for a clearer roadmap to the appropriate sales contact. Mm -hmm. So um, of everything that you've just mentioned, are there any specific content pieces, visual or otherwise, that lead them naturally to making contact with someone from your either your inside or outside sales? So we try to have relevant calls to action throughout the whole website. We've, when it comes to a request for contact, for example, we have a couple different approaches. We have the standard demo request web page, so. The intent there would be if you want to see the product in action, you would fill out that form. We've also uh, created a form called Speak with an Industry Expert. I think that that is a little bit more friendly than um, a demo request, which might insinuate somebody is going to be trying to sell to me. Right. Um, so those are two two outlets that we have. And then on our just general Contact Us page, Per region, we list all of our sales reps by name so that if uh, an individual wants to get in contact with somebody specific on the team, they can go to, the, go to that particular page and find the information they would need. Okay. Well, I didn't realize that. I mean, those three examples are excellent ways for you to basically give the user choices and mm -hmm. based on where they are in their queries or their buying stage, they, they can basically self-select. Those are great examples, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so moving on to another finding, uh, as we always do, um, we basically try to match up 
what content, specific content, uh, marketing content they want based on the stage they are in their buying process. Um, and when it came to mid-stage uh, versus early or end stage, uh, what came out is that they're looking primarily for vendor comparison white papers. Now, I know, you know, historically having followed marketers' attempts to supply the right content in their portfolios, that of all the types of content, sometimes creating vendor comparisons is controversial because you are basically laying out information about your competition. And I know that some marketers feel that um, they don't want to do that. However, we see consistently that the users want this information and they think very highly of the marketing organizations that provide it. Um, they also want case studies, but the survey reflects that they're looking for the case studies closer to when they're making a final decision in their end stage of the buying process. Um, and conversely, um, in a sense, the marketers in the study responded that they think the users want case studies primarily in both mid and end stage. So um, I think it would be really interesting to everyone listening in if you could explain how you handle both of these content pieces, if in fact you do, um, and if you provide them in both stages or one over the other. Sure. Uh, so first, I think I think the finding makes a lot of sense if we think about the buyer's journey, right? When you're um, when you're in the early stage, you have your problem identified and you're figuring out what solutions might solve that. Um, at Sana, we we did in the past put pretty heavy emphasis on reference cases. And we have quite a few written reference cases and a few videos that uh, we use and we do use in nurture flows, which would be considered early stage. Um, but more importantly, sales is using those uh, towards the end of the sales cycle. They also get requests to speak directly to customers again late in the sales cycle. So I think all of that makes sense. Uh, at Sana, we've only recently started to add vendor comparison information to our website. And we've been doing that in the form of blogs. Um, I don't have any any quantitative data regarding performance of those, but the feedback from the sales team has been very positive. Um, they're saying that they that they use these when they're talking to prospects. So I think that I think that it is a good tool, and we do have more of them planned for the future. And like I said, I think the the finding makes a lot of sense, and definitely will um, impact how I'm thinking about what we're doing with uh, with reference cases versus comparisons. Okay. Well, that's a great tip for everybody um, in terms of how you put that comparative information out. Uh, I think what I hear Stephanie saying is that you don't necessarily have to create a formal uh, white paper. Uh, lots of times, uh, historically, companies would hire a third-party research firm to do that to ensure that the comparison was uh, objectively put forth. Uh, because the users demanded that. In this case, um, I can see where you have a little more control about putting out there in a blog. Um, and it's also very insightful to hear what a great sales tool it's become as well. So great mm -hmm. tip, Stephanie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, uh, <clears throat> one of the key findings had to do about asking the users when it comes to your favorite sources for quote, uh, relevant industry information. Um, uh, they coincidentally enough, they indicated that uh, they are really big on blogs, especially expert ones. Uh, this ranked number one of all the sources. Um, so you just mentioned it, but if you could um, expound a little more on offering expert blogs, um, and if you do, please tell us by who and what they cover. Um, and if you don't, do you affiliate yourself with any outside blogs? Sure. So we do have um, we do have blogs on our own website written by internal experts. We don't leverage any external sources at this time to contribute content to our site. Uh, so one example there is. Um, could be uh, one of our e-commerce consultants, could be somebody from the C-suite or another more technical role. 
Um, and I, I have one open in front of me right now called How to Build a Successful E-Commerce Team. And basically what this does is provides information to the, to the reader on the different type of roles that might need to be involved um, in order to have a successful e-commerce project. And this is coming from one of our customer success managers at, the, at SANA. That's great. And have you seen good traction with those? Again, not, uh, I don't have qualitative data to to report on that, um, but I think I think pieces of content like this are extremely useful um, with existing customers. I think they're useful with uh, with prospects as well. And as a marketing organization, we can never produce a piece of content that's as detailed as somebody in the particular job function can, simply because you can't do desk research and get to that same level of uh, on the job experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so you're really leveraging uh, blogs, both on the product side and on the educational side. Uh, And that's something for everyone to really focus on, because, uh, you know, you can basically get a lot of play out of developing the same kind of content. So on the same finding um, re- related to what the users consider relevant industry information, uh, one of the things that's different from last year, and uh, just a reminder to everybody, the other reason we do these uh, research studies annually is we benchmark them year to year, and we are going into our fifth year. So uh, part of my analysis to see what stayed the same and what's changed. And one of the things that did change significantly is when asking the users about uh, the sources they're going to for relevant industry information, um, the ranking for Google has really slid down. Um, And this could be because they're looking at Google more as a search tool for vendors or something very specific. But when we're talking broadly about relevant industry information, they're not making that association as they are with the blogs. So the question I have for you, Stephanie, is given this as context, um, could you explain to everyone how you are leveraging Google and what would be the difference between using Google or a third-party editorial site, um, you know, like MSDW or any other site, uh, in terms of your investing marketing budget in them? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to Google, of course, Google is a must-do. Um, and from an organic perspective, we're constantly working to improve our SEO and making sure that we're ranking on uh, relevant keyword phrases that people might be using to find our business. So I would say that that's pretty, um, the, the phrases that we're ranking on are, are pretty specific to our products. So uh, the use of Google there could be um, for people coming directly to our website a little bit further along in the journey, or at least, you know, knowing that they want, a, you know, an ISV solution for their, their particular Microsoft product. Um, we also do a little bit with Google ads too, but our business is, is really a niche within a niche. So, um, it's difficult to hit the right target audience. Um, so what we're doing with Google, as I mentioned, it's a must do, but it's definitely a very different strategy than why we would use an editorial site like Microsoft Dynamics World. Um, I think as a reader of Microsoft Dynamics World content, I know that that's a trusted source. It feels um, more neutral. It doesn't feel self-serving from businesses. Uh, So I think when you look at the content being published on editorial sites like Microsoft Dynamics World, you get a little bit more credibility um, if there is content from Sana on the site, it's maybe positioned more as a little, a little bit more as a thought leadership piece mm-hmm. um, versus some, you know, if it's on our own website, it could come off as self-serving. So I think that there's some different elements to def- different, bene- different marketing benefits that you might get from um, using sites like Microsoft Dynamics World as part of your overall marketing strategy. Yeah. So those points all make a lot of sense. And um, I, and I think the takeaway from this discussion uh, today is that the research study uh, simply reinforces every year that there are a, a lot of different content sources that your potential buyers are looking for. 
and they use them accordingly to where they are in their querying and their buying stage. Um, so, you know, once again, we're back to the realization that to market effectively, uh, it's really important to have a full content portfolio. And um, conversations with uh, people like Stephanie and looking at the research just helps us all figure out uh, you know, when and where to plug in specific content and when not to. Um, so, Stephanie, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, and and like to uh, have a, a future conversation with you. Um, I'm I'm hoping there'll be some other subjects that we can share with the audience. And uh, in terms of the research study, we will be uh, uh, promoting and sending that out shortly, and in the future, doing a full comprehensive webcast around it. So take care, everyone, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>